Hey, everybody. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Very glad to have all of you along with us today and also glad that we're going to be able to get a little bit of an insider's look uh, into our retirement system, into how it works, why it works the way it does, what perhaps needs to be changed, what needs to be shifted. Um, and we're going to do it from the perspective of somebody who was until recently an insider. Uh, ben Harris was most recently the chief economist at the U.S. Treasury Department. He worked um, with President Biden both in the White House and uh, when he was vice president. And he is the co-author of a new book called The Retirement Challenge, which digs into what's wrong with America's system and offers us a sensible way to fix it. In fact, that is that is its subtitle. He co-wrote the book with Martin Bailey, also a former White House economist. And we've got him with us today to, to look into what we can do to help ourselves, but perhaps what the government is working on to help us as well. Ben, thanks so much for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. So before we dig into the book, and the book offers us a lot of, of meat and potatoes to dig into, talk to me a little bit about what it's like to emerge from Washington after several years there recently. What what are you feeling coming out of the administration about what's going wrong, what's going right, what what uh, what we can do um, perhaps better and and what's already going along swimmingly? Yeah, that's a great question. And I and it could take a long time to unpack that, but let me give you just a few examples. So, uh, you know, these are really intense jobs. These are jobs where you often don't take weekends, you know, you, you work throughout the night. And so I've been out for about seven weeks now and still going through this decompression uh, and kind of enjoying the lack of, lack of intensity. But I think that, I think I'm feeling fairly optimistic today. And, and I gave a speech yesterday to a group of economists on climate. And that's an area where I think we've made enormous progress in two years. You see with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that was really the Climate Emissions Reduction Act. Uh, and it, you know, I think it's in terms of climate change, which is something that people across the board worry about, that bill just laid the groundwork for enormous progress over 10 years. Uh, and just looking at the le legislative achievements, many of which were bipartisan, over the past couple of years, we had a big infrastructure package. We had this climate package, which unfortunately wasn't bipartisan, but the infrastructure bill was. There was a bill called the CHIPS package, which allows us to really jump ahead of our competitors in terms of semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. So I feel optimistic, not just for the next year or two, but the fact that these three bills, two of which were bipartisan, uh, were passed and are able to allow the, lay the groundwork for like 10 years or more of growth. I'm feeling really optimistic. Um, as far as, you know, one lesson that I really learned has been that for a lot of us that worry about things like the well-being of the U.S. consumer, that worry about even retirement, which is just as much about saving as is spending in your older years, and that worry about issues like inequality, uh, you know, one lesson I've taken away from the past two and a half years is that a, a really tight labor market coupled with housing stability is just great for the U.S. consumer. It's really good for American households. The black unemployment rate is now down to 4.7%, which is historic. Uh, I mean, I was just remembering today how in May of 2020, during the pandemic, it was up to almost 17%, which is just terrifying. And so we've made a lot of progress on the labor market and, and having workers be in demand, coupled with all these programs to help preserve housing stability, has, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good equation for American households. Yeah, and it's nice nice to see that you you come out of the administration with optimism. You, you and I had an opportunity to speak um, before this broadcast launched, and I asked for your impressions about the retirement system specifically. Um, you said there's some optimism, some pessimism, but the words, the phrase you used was out of date. Why out of date? So we had this big change in the retirement system over the past 20 or 30 years, and it's virtually complete. 
And we went from a system in the 1970s and before where uh, we had a, a robust social security system, which was in place, um, and that hasn't changed. But for everything else, you would get a pension through your workplace if you got anything at all, right? So some people got these pensions and some people got nothing. And there wasn't a ton of saving uh, in workplace retirement accounts outside of that pension. And then things started to change and it started slowly and then has accelerated and is now virtually complete. And now we have a system where you still have those big government programs as the bedrock of retirement for most people. But for everything else, it's all about saving, saving through your home, saving through your 401k, saving maybe you're a small business owner or just saving in a checking account. Um, and I think it's out of date because it's incomplete. It's, it's a good system in many ways. People have a lot of money saved up in the aggregate. And there are a lot of people at the bottom end of the, of the distribution who don't have anything. Um, but most families have quite a bit of resources by the time they reach retirement. But it's incomplete because we don't have a way to take all of this wealth and turn it into security. And that's, and that's the real problem. We don't have a way of turning it into a steady, stable, reliable income stream. So, so just to sort of rephrase that, that problem, we, we've gotten really good at accumulation, but not so good at the flip side, right? At taking, at taking, and I, I believe the number is something close to 33 or 34 trillion dollars, correct? In, in retirement plans and, and turning it into income or, or stability. Well, what, when yeah. you say stability, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is that the, I mean, the heart of the problem is that there's a lot of risk in retirement. And risk is an interesting word because risk is just synonymous with uncertainty. And the primary source of uncertainty in retirement is we just don't know how long we'll live. And uh, we've had, you know, in general, increased longevity over time, life expectancy is going up. It's actually one of the most fantastic achievements by humankind. I mean, it's, it's a good story, but the, the drawback is, is that we have a set level of resources when we enter retirement. And we just don't know how long we need to make that nest egg last. And the uncertainty is just fantastic. I mean, you can have a 60-year-old woman who's uh, you know, perhaps retiring or, niche, or reaching retirement age, and there's about a 1 in 10 chance that she'll die in the next 10 years. And there's about a 1 in 10 chance she'll live to 95. And then you know, an 80% chance... She'll, she'll die between 70 and 95. So you really, you have to deal with all this uncertainty and it's almost, it's almost an impossible problem. And so the whole notion behind the book is we're taking this impossible problem and trying to suggest ways to make, to make it possible to retire in a way where it allows you to enjoy the resources that you've worked so hard for um, in, in a way that, that I think a lot of people don't have right now. So I want to focus on those solutions, but before we focus on the solutions, can we speak specifically to women? Because it is a problem, but it's it's a bigger problem for women and an even bigger problem for women of color. Yeah. I mean, the statistics around women of color and poverty are are really sad. I mean, I don't think that any like I like with the richest country in the world, anyone being in poverty is a tragedy. It's particularly a tragedy when you have people who've worked their whole lives uh, and just don't deserve to be in poverty. The statistics for elderly poverty overall are quite promising. There's not a lot of, of poverty. We give a lot of resources to Social Security and Medicare, and that helps people. But for women in, in general and single women in particular and single women of color of, you know, very much in particular, we have elevated rates of poverty much lower uh, rates of ownership for 401ks. Uh, and you have older people who really have no recourse. And many times they're too old to, to go back into the labor market. And they kind of are just very dependent on whatever resources they can get through public programs. And so that's a, that's a bit of a tragedy. I mean, I think there is some reason to be more optimistic about women's outcomes down the line because women are having such positive labor market outcomes. Yeah. Uh, women are increasingly the breadwinners in, in households. Uh, women's rates of college attainment are really high. Labor force participation by women is really high. So, you know, I think that 20 or 30 years from now, there's reason to be a bit more optimistic. But if we don't solve this problem, 
for giving people a reasonable path for spending down all of their wealth, uh, there will still be challenges in retirement. So, so let's talk about let's talk about solutions and um, let's talk about the building block of those solutions, which for many people is Social Security. I know that it frustrates economists like you to no end that many people claim Social Security um, at sixty two or you know well before full retirement age and and even more before age seventy where they could get a, a bigger payout, substantially bigger payout. What, what, why is that? What, what is happening there? So I think that there are a few things. One, I, I think that people just have preferences for getting uh, their, their money now. And that's not always irrational. I mean, if you expect to be really active in say your 60s and maybe early 70s, and you want more money now to enjoy your retirement when you feel like you can just get out there and maybe go on vacation or spend more time with your grandkids. That's not completely irrational, but I think what's driving a lot of it is a sense that social security is going bankrupt and I, it's almost like a bank run, you know, right. like I need to get my money out now before, before the problem materializes. And that's just not going to happen. I think that people have far too little faith in social security. Well, give us a little faith. I mean, I, I've read the headlines and I've also read surveys. Um, research from, from the Alliance for Lifetime Income really points to the fact that there's not a lot of faith that Social Security will be there um, to, to pay you back what you've paid into the system. Yeah. I mean, so one of my jobs at Treasury was overseeing the working group that puts out all these projections. Uh, so I've got the numbers burned into my brain, but like Social Security right now has a trust fund and that's because more people are paying in or they had for a long time more we're paying in uh, than we're getting benefits out. And that trust fund is expected to be exhausted in 2033, at which time, if nothing else changes, roughly eight and ten dollars that are promised can still go out. So you can kind of think of that as a worst case scenario, which is you'll still get 80 percent of your, your benefits. One of the problems when we talk about Social Security is you hear the word bankrupt being used a lot. And bankruptcy suggests that it can no longer operate. And even under the worst case scenario, Social Security will still pay out most of its, its benefits. I think the far more likely scenario is that Congress would just say, look, these, you know, these retirees deserve their full promised benefits. And you would just get a transfer, a government transfer uh, into Social Security and, and beneficiaries would be made whole. Do you think that's more likely than raising the full retirement age? I mean, we're all paying we're all paying attention to what's going on in France and and the protests and and uh, how how likely a scenario do you think that is? Well, I don't know if we would see a rise in the retirement age. I mean, I think that that there are a series of plausible solutions which can buy us another 15, 20 years of solvency in social security. I mean, there's so many problems that are right in front of us, and if we can push the Social Security uh, trust fund exhaustion date from 2033 out to 2050 by some tweaks in the program. I think that'd be terrific. The Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, as credible as you can get, a few years ago put out a menu of options. They said, here are 36 different fixes for Social Security. Policymakers can choose them. You know, you could imagine a package that put together two or three of these different possible fixes on both the revenue and the spending side. And, uh, and and added another 15, 20 years to Social Security. The only real question is, is does Congress have the will to do it? And you need 60 votes in the Senate uh, for any Social Security reform. So it, it's going to take a lot of congressional will, but we have a menu of options right now. So once we get past that building block and, and, and Social Security representing an average, what, 40% of, of what people live on in retirement, um, the rest is this puzzle of taking money, in many cases, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that you've socked away in a 401k and, and turning it into that security that you spoke about. What is the stumbling block? Well, we don't have great products for making that transformation. You know, right now, the paradigm with retirement is basically just saying, you know, save like crazy during your working years and then hope that you don't outlive your assets. And that's a terrible paradigm. I mean, it's terrible because <laughs> it's, scary. Of it's scary and it's also it can be improved. I mean, 
you know, there's this notion that that more saving is always better. And that's not always true. And you know, in, in economic models, what you want to do is you make yourself really happy between being well balanced, between uh, not working too much and buying things that make you happy and spend, you know, putting all your money in your 401k is sometimes seen as a virtue, but it doesn't make you as happy as possible in, in economic models. Saving is undoubtedly a good thing, but there's also a such thing as, as oversaving. And so um, what you really need is you need products or avenues or mechanisms for taking some of that wealth that you have at the end of life, which isn't just your 401k, can also be liquid savings outside your 401k. And for a lot of people, it means your house and turning that into a stream of income so you can enjoy yourself and buy whatever makes you happy. Um, and right now, we just don't have those avenues. Now, annuities are the product that economists love and consumers either don't know about or don't love. And in economic models, annuities do really well because they eliminate this uncertainty as far as outliving your assets. You know, the fact you might be able to go ahead and buy an annuity and, and get a steady stream of income performs really well in economic models because people are able to, to do a better job of spending uh, their, their, their assets. Well, it gives you the freedom to know that you can spend this paycheck because another paycheck is coming. Right. And if you're if you're pulling assets out of your retirement portfolio by the four percent or other rule and you hit a bear market, um, all of a sudden you're feeling like you can no longer pull that paycheck or you can't pull a paycheck that's quite as as big. And foundationally, I think that 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 feels more risky. I mean, I, I like the idea of using an annuity to at least cover your fixed costs, right? And and then you can decide if you want to take one or two vacations a year with the variable money. But but a lot of people have trouble wrapping their brains around the idea of giving a chunk of money to an insurance company for a paycheck. Do you can you get into why? Well, yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is people don't always don't always trust the insurance companies. And uh, like there may be rational reasons not to buy an insurance, not to buy an annuity, but having a lack of faith in insurance companies probably isn't one of them. I mean, we went through the great financial crisis and uh, every contract for annuity that I'm aware of was paid. Right. So like these are these are rock solid hundred percent of these contracts get paid for typical annuities. Um, and so I think that that fear really isn't, isn't there. And I think people feel like they're losing something that they've worked hard for and they're giving it to another entity. Uh, and I understand that emotional attachment. I mean, I really do, but, uh, intellectually it's just for many people, not the right decision. It's an insurance product. And, and I, I think that that's sort of, misunderstood in many cases, right? If you take a chunk of money and and granted, I know that that a lot of products these days have return of premium riders, you can you can get some of your money back. But basically, you're 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 taking a chunk of money, you hand it to an insurance company, they are paying you as long as you live. If you die soon, you lose. And if you live a really long time, you win. Now, to me, and I think to many women, this idea of if I live a really long time is a lot scarier than losing a little bit of money. But yeah. for a lot of people, I think the calculus is different. Yeah. And I will say, I mean, when, when you look at economic models, as far as how people do best, one of the strategies is taking your liquid wealth, you know, the money you have in your 401k and taking about an eighth of that and putting it into a deferred annuity or even an immediate annuity. So deferred annuity is one that might pay out at age 75. And, uh, and that way you have the freedom to go ahead and spend the remaining seven eighths of, of all of your savings. Um, but you have the security that is purchased with that one eighth uh, immediate uh, contract you bought from the annuity company uh, and from the insurance company. And so this isn't to say, I mean, the recommendation from the models is not take all of your wealth and put it all into an annuity. 
it's just diversify a little bit and make sure that those older ages, you'll still have that income stream coming in and use, you know, a small chunk of, of what you've saved to ensure that. And I think that, that people may be a little more comfortable with that, particularly if you see other people doing it. And so, so many of our decisions are made based on what our peers and our family do. And so I can see this maybe picking up steam down the road. Do you think that it's going to pick up steam because of the changes that we've seen with both secure acts? I mean, secure act, the secure acts have made it easier for annuities to be added to 401k plans in plan solutions. And they've bumped up the amount of money that you can put into a QLAC, which I'll leave to you to explain. Yeah. So, I mean, th- on the QLAC, what it does is it allows you to use a larger share of your retirement saving to purchase an uh, annuity that, that pays out down the line without violating these rules about how much you can take out of how much you have to spend from your, uh, from your plan. So the mandatory distributions. Basically, it allows you to buy an annuity without violating rules around mandatory distributions from your 401k. But what Secure Act does, and I think you're right to point this out, is it has a vision where employers can be a bigger part of not just saving, but of choosing how to spend down your assets in retirement. I mean, retire employers have been on the front lines in, in helping people save for retirement. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, they're sort of a disinterested party in general. They offer you a host of usually really safe, sound investments for you to put your, your money into a 401k. They often match the 401k uh, as a way of recruiting workers who, who value saving. Um, but they've been, they've been a pretty credible source of information and a pretty credible avenue for saving. And so in our book, Martin Bailey and I were really optimistic about the role of employers helping their workers choose how to spend down some of their saving and put some money into an annuity, which you know, you basically have this trusted entity helping you make decisions about how to spend it down. And that's the real key, which is turning to employers because they're trusted and because they've been part of your decision about how much to save. Yeah, I, I could see people being being comfortable with that, right? We, we trust the people that are giving us our paychecks, basically. Yeah, exactly. The another solution that you you mentioned earlier is is accessing the equity in your home. A lot of people get to retirement and they have, um, you know, accumulated some money in a in a 401k and maybe um, they've they've paid off or have come close to paying off a home that is worth a sizable chunk of their nest egg. I actually, you know, in, in looking at what's happening with, with interest rates, I mean, we went through this period where interest rates rates were at rock bottom, where people were just refining and refining and refining and not paying off mortgages. Well, as, as rates go up and people dig in their heels and don't move, which has caused a little bit of a problem in housing supply, um, they're going to pay off those homes um, a little bit more. So, so this, I think, is a, is a more likely scenario. How do you, how do you think about the home as, as a part of your portfolio? So one thing Martin and I did in our book is we looked at kind of a snapshot of just a whole big sample of people who are nearing retirement age. And it's really tough to tell a story about retirement because people are so different. There's a lot of people who just have nothing in terms of really any assets to speak of. There's a lot of people that are diversified across 401ks and, you know, they own a few cars and they've got a home. There's a bunch of people that just have a ton saved. And, you know, someone with $5 million in a 401k is not something you worry about from a retirement perspective. But there's a lot of people that have $25,000 or less saved in a retirement account but have two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in equity in their home. And if I told you that we've got this share of people who actually have a lot saved, but it's just sitting in an asset that they don't want to sell, uh, that feels like a real opportunity to help them tap that asset and um, and you know have a better retirement. So we we looked into reverse mortgages as a possible option among a, a broader suite of different different choices. Reverse mortgages um, have not the best reputation. I mean, I, I think with with the um, with the 
introduction of of what's called a HECM mortgage, which is mm-hmm. is a little more standardized by the government. They've certainly gotten better um, in the last decade, but there's a lot of confusion around them. Who are they right for, and who aren't they right for? So they would be. I think that you're right. I mean, this is a product which does not have a solid reputation, and the theme of what we're all talking about here, Jean, is is trust. I mean, we've talked about trust so much, trust in your employer. Uh, A lot of times people want to make choices when they've seen a peer do it. And so trust is such a big part of retirement. And so the fact that reverse mortgages have a somewhat checkered history, I think, is is a real problem. But theoretically, they're really appealing because they're the answer for someone who has a $400,000 house that they've mostly paid off. They want to stay in the house. As many older people do, they're comfortable in their homes, they like their neighbors, they don't want to move to facility, and they don't want to move to a new community. Um, And reverse mortgages allow you to stay in the home. They allow you to take out, effectively, they allow you to take out a loan against the future proceeds of your house and at, you know, fairly reasonable interest rates. And so who are they right for in theory? Uh, They are right for people who have a lot of money in their homes who don't want to move for some time and maybe for whom uh, leaving a bequest to kids is not the biggest deal because, you know, you are going to have to pay this back at the end. Uh, Now you're still going to have to go ahead and make your property tax payments and you're going to have to maintain the home, but that's true of anyone who is in a home and and owns it, regardless of whether or not you have a reverse mortgage or not. Um, It's interesting. I I do think that, that, they're worth a look for more people than have looked at them lately. Um, and, and I like the fact that uh, there is a mandatory counseling process that you have to go through before you're allowed to take out a reverse mortgage, which is sort of meant a, as a consumer protection so that at least you, at least you know what you're getting into. Look, look into your crystal ball for me. Um, and, and tell me what the retirement landscape looks like um, for, for future generations, um, for, for my kids, for your kids. What, what, what kind of, what are, what are they looking at as compared to this, this shifting landscape that, that we've come through? So I think that they will have a system where, um, it's very flexible. And that's one of the great things about the current system is that there, people have such different circumstances. They have such different preferences. Uh, they have different ways that they want to retire. And the system, if nothing else, is pretty flexible. And so I think you'll see a maintained flexibility. I think you'll see people choosing to retire uh, in very different ways. Some people will take a few years off when they reach a certain point in their life and then maybe hop back in the labor market. I think that remote work has offered up a whole new set of options for older workers. Um, I think you're seeing some people who are staying healthier longer and and might work for social reasons or for intellectual stimulation in addition to to a paycheck. Um, But I think one one big thing that you'll see is I think you'll see a shift in mindset away from wealth and towards income. And I think when you hear diversification, Right now, if someone says diversification, I think everyone's mind immediately thinks to, okay, diversification of investments. You know, like, okay, I can't have all my money in my own company stock. I mean, that used to happen a lot more. We had Enron and other crises and kind of realized, look, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So when people say diversification, we think about diversification of investments. But I think people think more in terms of diversification of income. And so, you know, maybe you get your Social Security check. You've got your annuity. Uh, maybe you've got, you know, this open line of credit on your home because of reverse mortgages. Maybe you're like, look, I'm going to go drive Uber for 15 hours a week because I want to make some extra money. Or maybe I'm going to be a consultant or be a teacher. Um, But you'll see people being able to diversify their income streams, which is really exciting because it just means more flexibility uh, for, for everyone who's in retirement. So I know you, um, as you mentioned, you came out of the administration seven weeks ago, seven and a half weeks ago. Um, what's next? Oh, for me personally? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, I think one thing that I've discovered is that I really enjoy being an economist. Um, 
Uh, I've just been really busy. We have this debt ceiling crisis. So I spent a lot of time going on TV, testified to Congress two days ago, gave a talk yesterday. So for me, I think I'm going to stay in the policy space. Uh, we'll either be at a university or a think tank, most likely. And, um, you know, it's just been an honor and a privilege working with people to save, solve some of our nation's big problems. Uh, and there's no one who's been a bigger privilege than working with Secretary Janet Yellen, who is uh, just one of the most brilliant, wonderful people you've ever met. So um, I'm going to just keep doing what I'm doing and, uh, and working on these big problems and, and talking to smart people like you. Oh, well, thank you for talking uh, to all of, all of us today. The book is The Retirement Challenge. You can get it wherever uh, you order your books. Um, and, and Ben, where should I send people who would like more information about the work that you're doing? Uh, well, you know, for the book, you can go to any place that sells books. And for me, I'll, I'll land on an institution soon. And I'm sure you'll see my, my face on TV and uh, my writings in, in various, uh, uh, you know, media outlets around the country. And for more information on this conversation, you can go to our website, which is protectedincome.org slash Harris. Ben, thanks so much. Thank you.